This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, we bring an example of the research which is being done at the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus, dealing with subjects such as atmospheric sciences, oceanography, earth science, and planetary science. And it's my pleasure today to welcome back two of my very best friends, because we're going to be talking about planetary science. We have Linda Martell and Jeff Taylor, who are both at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. You've been hosts on this show, so you know the ropes. So welcome back. And Thank you. I believe we're going to hear an update on Pacific, uh, PSRD, PSRD, Planetary Space Research Discoveries. Is that correct, Linda? Yep, we have a, a big project we've been doing for 21 years. 20, 21. Yeah, one, yeah. 21. Um, Planetary scientists, I think, think of the Earth. In, it, it's one of the planets in the little community of the solar system. So we like to think about planetary processes and compare Earth with other planets and, and all the processes that are happening on them. So planetary science research discoveries um, reads the research papers about planetary science. We read them, and then we rewrite it for a more general audience. OK, so this is uh, a web-based Yep, it's informational posting that you do for uh, the, the general community, correct? Right, right. So we do have um, other scientists reading it, but they might not be chemists or physicists. So we try to write it so that anybody outside, um, somebody studying Mars, will understand what's going on and what the discoveries are and how they came to be and what they mean for us on Earth. And, and you're not actually doing the research, but you're rephrasing the material which has previously been published, That's probably right. quite recently, yeah. so that the, the general scientific community can understand it. Yeah, and their, and their parents and their families. Yeah. <laughs> right. Not just other scientists, but yeah. uh, the general public who is interested in science, kind of the same people who would read Scientific American. And, mm -hmm. and I know you've been on this show in the past discussing PSRD, um, but do you have any understanding how many people might actually be reading this kind of website? So we're looking at monthly hits around 60,000 a month, which is kind of good for something that's cosmochemical in nature. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> we're not, we're not um, so much mission oriented, but we're looking at the researchers who are taking the data and looking at the rocks and reporting on that. And Linda, by mission, you don't mean you're supported by a NASA space mission per se. Mm. Um, it, mission would be trying to promote STEM education, or mission would oh, yes. be right. trying to sort of encourage local school kids to do something. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah, right. we're a communication. Um, we're now funded by the NASA, uh, what is it called? The Directorate? Uh, it's uh, Science Emerging Science. Worlds Program. So, fundamentally funds us now. And Emerging Worlds, Jeff, is part of NASA's planetary program. Planetary research effort, yes. Planetary mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. effort. And you've been doing this for 21 years? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> How many articles do you have? So well, we're closing up to 200. 200, yeah. 200 full-length articles. And we, uh, the first one, by the way, was the Life on Mars debate from the famous Martian meteorite, whose name is Ellen Hills 84001, for anyone keeping score. <laughs> and so we, yeah, it was, that was an interesting article. It was one of our more complicated ones. And we tried to give pros and cons of ideas. And there, there was a lot of pros and cons uh, of this, Jeff, this, yeah. this and asserted it's still a discovery. And controversy at some level, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah, it is. There is no complete consensus. Well, there actually is a consensus. But the original uh, discoverers are not backing down from them. And what we really learned from it, you know, it was an interesting thing how science works. We really learned what you have to do, even if you have a sample of a rock from another planet, yeah. to prove that there was life in it. Very difficult job. Uh, we had HIGP people working on that issue. Ed Scott did a paper on it. We covered it yeah. in PSRD. Um, and that this issue of water on Mars and life on Mars, of course, is big today. 
I mean, it started as 21 years ago, but yeah. it's still carrying through. So you've had about 200 articles in 21 years, so a little less than one article a month. Is that the sort of production? <laughs> yeah, that's our target. That's what we <laughs> that's target, good, yeah. Target. <laughs> and Linda, I think you brought along a slide which just shows the, the front of your, your website. If we go to the first slide, we can actually see, of course, here we have the, uh, the URL at the, the top mm -hmm. left for anybody who's keen on seeing. So, um, Jeff, can you just describe a little bit about what we have here? We can see the parts and pieces of it. It has uh, the, uh, the big prominent thing on the left-hand column is the headline article. That means the one we got up within the past month. And in this case, it's about volcanism and creation of an ancient atmosphere on the moon of all places. And, and I then, believe we'll be talking about that in the second half of the show. Yes. Day. And then there's a list of all the most recent articles down there. And then on the right, you see a Cosmo Spark. These are short reports, and we have over 100 of them now, I think, yes. where we highlight something interesting without going into the depth that we do in the big articles. And you can see the title. Um, uh, uh, like the second one... Oh, that's what we're going to talk about next. The, the bounty of our bounty of our meteorites found, found on Mars. Mars. Yes, can't wait to get to that. <laughs> and one. the bottom is Apollo 17 Taurus Lithro value. This is a review article written by Jack Schmidt and others to go back to the Apollo 17 site, and he reinterprets his field observations in the context of all this vast remote sensing and sample studies that were done. And I believe done. one of the co-authors was a former graduate student of ours, Mark Robinson. Correct. Yep, that's right. Yeah. 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 Great. And then falling and then, off the bottom of the screen, we have news and other things as well. Other things. And along the top, you can see this. We archive everything by topic, and you can search it. It is a search uh, thing. There's a subscription. We have 15, 1,600 subscribers in 57 countries where they don't, they don't pay for the subscription, but every time we have something new go up, they get an email. In 57 different countries. Yeah. Right. Remarkable. <laughs> yeah. How did you get the word out that this is such a... Uh, a I, it gets source of spread. It is word of mouth or, or internet. Electronic <laughs> word, yes. <laughs> yeah, electronic word. And uh, people, um, it, it's amazing how we get letters sometimes, emails from, from the general public. And what they like is that it does go into detail, doesn't talk down to them, though we try to be very clear. And the people who really want the story go to it. At the same time, scientists in one field, uh, especially like a geophysicist who doesn't know much geochemistry, he'll read these articles because that keeps him up to date on these things without him being bogged down by massive amounts of geochemical oh, jargon. Using, um, astronomy classes to yeah, uh, for geochemistry. undergraduates, students studying for their comprehensive exams. <laughs> We've had numerous people tell us that that's what they do from other places. And well, so. the topic of today's program is hot topics in PSRD. So Linda, why don't we go on to the next slide and you can tell us a little bit about one of the exciting reports which yep. uh, okay. Jeff alluded to on that website. Um, so what do we have here? Can you explain for our viewers what we're, we're looking at here? Those, all those images are the surface of Mars and these were taken, the images were taken by cameras on rovers that are on Mars right now, those robotic rovers. So there's no astronauts <laughs> ever yet on Mars. But up on the top left, it says Meridiani Planum. That was the first iron meteorite ever, or first meteorite ever to be found on another planetary surface. And what's the sort the of scale of that? Rock? That one they said is the size of a basketball. Okay. Now, so you have to imagine their cameras on the rover sort of scanning the landscape. And how would they ever even notice this rock? But a scientist realized that the the bounce of light off that rock matched the Martian sky. And he thought, well, the only way to do that is to have something shiny that can bounce that. And they were like right. surface, yeah. And they thought, could it be a meteorite? And then by chemistry, they decided it was an iron nickel meteorite. And all of the other rocks which we're seeing now are also meteorites? All meteorites, all iron nickel seen meteorites. Seen by the rovers driving across the surface. Mm -hmm and they're identifying rocks which have fallen from space because we've had Ed Scott come on the show uh, and talking about meteorites. So what makes them special apart from the fact that they're on Mars? Okay, first those 
So those rovers were never, their mission was never to look for meteorites right on the surface. So it was a special thing to sort of find them and realize that these pieces could make it through the Martian atmosphere and land uh, without or some of them breaking up, right? We were talking yeah. about the atmosphere a little bit. Yeah, some, the atmosphere is pretty thin. And so things that are bigger than a football or something probably don't slow down. And so they would make a little crater. But at the same time, maybe they landed long ago when the atmosphere was thicker. Do we know anything about the age of these rocks? Or how long they've been on the surface of Mars? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> They're looking at the roundness, but we know that there's a, a lot of sand blasting going on yeah. on the yeah. surface, so yeah. they're thinking the roundedness of those rocks is probably just sand and, blasting. And is this set unique? Have we ever found, for example, Jeff, you're a lunar scientist, have we ever found a meteorite on the surface of the moon? We have actually found some on the surface of the moon. We found um, some melted iron meteorites in the very first mission, and uh, the cover of the science magazine issue describing the rock has a thing, it looks like a mini moon. It was a very funny iron sulfide thing that crystallized in a funny shape. And you mean back in the 1960s? Back in 1960s. <laughs> and then um, there was a, a little bit, several millimeters across, piece of what we call carbonaceous chondrite. And that is, is different from most, but now we have so many of those kind of meteorites that we can put it into a, a group. And its name, and it was the first to give a name of a geologic feature, it's called Bench Crater, mm -hmm. which is at Apollo 12. It was in Apollo 12. But 12. doesn't the fact that you can get, say, meteorites on the moon, as well as on Mars, raise some of the interesting possibilities? How, how does a rock get to one planet, maybe from the asteroid belt or another planet? <laughs> um, Big catastrophic Big collisions. Ca yeah, right. <laughs> and, and you can guess where I'm leading. I mm. mean, if you can see meteorites on the moon, the nearest object nearby is the Earth. Could we find a meteorite from the Earth on the moon? It, you would think that there must be. It has been looked at quantitatively, sort of, by how much impact would transfer out of Earth orbit, how much would land on the moon. The idea is that there could be a few in any lunar soil a few parts per million of Earth material. Now that means you have to look at C1, you have to look at almost a million little particles, but it can be done if you can automate it. And we're not talking about chunks of rock, which are the basketball size Linda you were showing right. us, yeah. but we're thinking about little fine grains. Little fi fine grains that could be a millimeter, a few millimeters, but could be, imagine if it was driven from the Earth four billion years ago, it could have the first life forms yeah. preserved in it. And certainly and you could see parts of the Earth's crust which are no longer present on the... the yeah, yeah. yeah. What and thing. even though you have a millimeter-sized object, it is possible to date them, uh, characterize the chemistry, and with all the microanalytical techniques that we have available now. I mean, the whole idea is is really exciting that you might be able to have Earth-like materials there. On the moon. And we, uh, as you probably know, at Manoa are working, Paul Lucy has his this team of smart people, he, uh, students he works with, to develop techniques to identify minerals that might be from Earth, and for that matter, anywhere else, and identify them spectrally and go in, take that sample out so we could sample it. And we're, they're working on these things now. The hard part is sampling it automatically. We haven't gotten that far yet, but I think we will be able to. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're getting towards a break now. And that was just one of the two hot topics, so we'll have to leave this particular discussion there, Jeff. But let me just remind the viewers, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and our guests today are Linda Martell and Jeff Taylor, who are both at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And we'll be back in about a minute's time.
host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solutions, how to make a brighter day. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark, and my guests today are Linda Martell and Jeff Taylor, who work together on planetary research discoveries. <laughs> CSRD. I've missed something out, but um, you are both researchers. Jeff, you're a professor at the university. And Linda, you help with the web design as well as some yep. of the... the I'm an web. academic support, so I, academic I'm support. helping with many NASA uh, uh, grants and proposals and doing a lot you of You do all the work and Jeff gets yeah, all the fame, that's not right? true. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be okay with me. <laughs> all right. So we saw on the, the first slide that there's a new hot topic, which is ancient lunar atmosphere. So I want to mm. delve into this particular topic in the second half of the show. And Jeff, I think you brought along some other illustrations. So if we can go on to the next slide. Um, this looks familiar even to me. Yeah. <laughs> did anybody see the, what did they call it last night? Supermoon? Super Supermoon. I was clouded yeah. out, but. Um, uh, it was great from my, where I lived. Uh, in, very good. Uh, in, in anyway, the, 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 you know, the moon is, is an airless body. It has, it has a, the atmosphere it has isn't even officially called an atmosphere because the uh, the molecules in it do not collide with each other, so it's called an exosphere. And it lacks an atmosphere because the moon is too small, small to lacks the gravity to yeah, retain the atmosphere. To retain the atmosphere, but that doesn't mean it never had one, and no one quite looked at this before. We see all those, this is the picture of the near side of the moon, you see those dark areas? Those are called the maria, and they're formed by lava eruptions, and the most efficient way of transferring, say, water and other volatile species, like sulfur dioxide, from the interior to the surface is in lava flow. And so this is a, uh, these, these lavas, when they came up, may have put quite copious amounts of material. Of, and of, the next illustration, if we go to the next slide, will emphasize the point that the volcanoes are pretty smelly, gassy kinds of, <clears throat> places to work, right? They are, and in fact, the picture on the left shows our host wisely protecting himself from noxious gases. And you can see the, the gases coming up in the, uh, on the volcanic feature on the right, which is in, where is that? It's that in, that's the Puro vent back well, in Puro about uh, 2002. Yeah, so these things put out really quite a lot of gas, and there is uh, a lot of gas in the in the atmosphere, uh, I mean, and it, it could be... And it's reasonable to assume that lunar lavas, when we had volcanic eruptions early in lunar history, would have been degassing the same amount? Or? Probably less than what the Earth does, because the Moon has less water. It does not have um, no water, like we used to think, but it does have less water per eruption than maybe right. by a factor of 10. Because we had years. Lionel Wilson uh, about three weeks ago on the show and he was talking about lunar lava flows and mm -hmm. fire fountains. and He didn't actually discuss much about the, the gas content of the magmas. But, uh, yeah, and it, it, we still don't know for sure. All we know is that the interior of the moon, the, the water in the interior of the moon is not uniformly distributed. <laughs> and presumably this changes as a function of time? Because uh, not all lunar lava flows are the same age. No. What well, really counts, it does change. You use up some when you erupt the lava, but most of the interior probably has not generated a lava, and so that water is whatever the primary water was. However, 
the ones that did erupt, if they erupt with enough volume in a given time, that may make a temporary atmosphere. But we're it's, talking millions of years ago. I yeah, mean, billions, the, in fact. The, the PSRD article, which is the, the hot topic on the website this, right yeah, now, one. can you walk us through what kinds of, first of all, who was doing this research, because it's not necessarily done at Manoa, but then what kinds of ideas are presented on the website? Oh, yeah. So the authors of this uh, are Deborah Needham, and she's at NASA Goddard. Marshall. Marshall, sorry. NASA Marshall, Marshall. Space Flight Center. And uh, Dave Kring, who's at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston. So um, Jeff wrote the article uh, based on their paper, and, and it steps through um, what they mapped out as lava flows at different time sequences to try to get an idea of volumes and of gas release. And, you know, on these articles, too, after Jeff does this great job of, of uh, turning it into a interesting, more common, you know, speak words, we pass it through those authors uh, to get their okay and their First of all, approval. Er, right. This is their did, we, idea. did we get everything straight? Did we miss anything? And, and, and before it ever goes out to the public, just to, just to cover yourselves and also to make sure it's scientific. Let's make sure it's Correct. right because right. we, yeah. you can inadvertently because uh, even I'm not an expert in everything. I know it's hard to <laughs> hard to believe, but um, you may oversimplify too much to the point where you make it wrong, and that's why we run it by the author. So that anybody reading our web website knows it's authoritative, and we've got it down. And we have a glossary, <laughs> which is always very and, handy. And searchable glossary is yeah. what I've seen. That's mm -hmm. really good. Yeah. Well, let's run through this sequence of this events. This sequence thing. of events. You've event. got uh, a, a number of slides here. So on the left-hand side, of course, so is the moon. Yes, there's a series of them. The moon is showing the same picture before of the near side, the one we see from when we look up at the full moon from the Earth. And what it will show is, uh, by colors, what lava flow came in in approximately half a billion year increments, starting about 3.6 billion years ago. All right, and time in billions of years at the bottom on the right-hand diagram is time before the present. Before the present. Okay. Right. So if we go Let's to the, the next, next one, that red, each new sequence has red lava because they just went in and they're red hot after all. And the graph on the right shows the volume of Mari basalt in cubic kilometers and in that time interval. So in the time interval of greater than 3.6 billion years ago, we had like one and a half uh, um, million uh, cubic kilometers erupted, right. and therefore that would put in a certain amount based on the assumed water. And by the way, sulfur dioxide and carbon monoxide, which actually are bigger in abundance than water. And so we don't confuse the viewers, uh, GA is billions oh, of years. Billions of years. All right. And let's run through And this part second. of Lady Gaga's name. Let's take a look at the next time step then. So now the red ones are the new ones added, and notice the big peak on the right yeah. is now five and a half million metric tons in a, in a half a billion year period, which is, when you start adding up the amount of all these gases, which is what Needham and Kring did in that interval, it is enough in this, this is the key interval here, to make an atmosphere that is a traditional atmosphere that is collisional. That is the molecules bumping into each other, and it is harder to escape. The escape rate goes up because there's more gas, but the amount is retained, and they estimate that it would be retained for 70 million years that the moon would have an atmosphere whose pressure is bigger than the current atmospheric pressure on Mars, and almost, almost 1% of what the Earth's atmospheric pressure is now. And, composition, and compositionally, would it include oxygen or nitrogen? No, it or? would be carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, and probably water vapor. And everything else would be in small no, amounts. And not, it would not be breathable. So maybe no, you'd more have like to... Venus rather than the Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, and yes. Okay, yes. And, and, and one final thing on this particular diagram, Jeff. The red patches, which are the more recent lavas in this time period, 
aren't in the same locality as the purple one. So no. did the center of volcanic activity change as we look at the moon a few times? It does change, but there is some overlap. I bet you if we look at the next one. Yeah, let's the, go on to the next one. And we'll... Like the Imbrian, the, see the, there's a red one in that big, Yeah. It, that's the man in the moon's right eye. Uh, that there's young flows on top of older flows. So we do get a lot of that. And that messes up the volume estimate, by the way, because you don't know, especially the volume in a given time period, because how many older ones are covered and you just don't know for sure what's underneath them. Sure. It requires good geological, and it goes uh, photogeology with, look. And it goes without saying that we're only seeing volcanic lava flows in the, the basins. You only see uh, You're not seeing it occurring in the, the not, highlands. Not everywhere, so yeah. Really yeah. All right. And I think we can run through one run, more, one more uh, slide. And that's just the youngest one. Notice that the big peak is early on between Three, around 3.4 to 3.6 is really where the action takes place in volcanism on the moon. And if you go to the next one, it shows a neat graph that they, is from uh, the one after that. And there's that. virtually nothing from, no, say, nothing much, no. 3.3 billion yeah. years ago to the present day. Yeah, and so the next one shows a graph of the, this is atmospheric pressure in PA is, uh, <laughs> is Pascal's, and that is about a thousand of that unit is about one atmosphere, which is what the Earth's atmosphere is, right? One atmospheric pressure, and or, uh, one percent of the Earth's atmospheric pressure. So it, it's uh, 10,000, 100,000 um, of this why, unit. Why having a lunar atmosphere? Why is that an important attribute to understand? Well, it is, well besides the fact that it changes the way we look at the moon. You can't look at the moon the same through time. It's not the same as in the past as it is now. So that's kind of interesting in itself. But the other thing is, all that those volatiles that came out might have migrated to places where it was permanently shadowed, uh. even then, and collect in lunar polar traps. And maybe some of them, we know there are gas at the lunar poles in permanently shadowed regions. So if we were ever to send a lander to the lunar poles and maybe take an ice core, what I think you're saying, Jeff, is that we might be able to see a, a record of the atmospheric, or the degassing. The degassing of the moon, and then when other processes like solar wind putting hydrogen on the lunar surface, maybe that's a component. Yeah. Maybe impactors that have a different, different nature of sulfur isotopes or hydrogen isotopes over time, maybe they give a different signal. So th there is a, a history of the moon's volcanism and bombardment possibly be preserved at the pole. Just as, say, if you take a Greenland or an Antarctica yeah, ice good, core. Yeah, good, good analogy, yes. Isn't that interesting? I mean, this the whole idea is that it's so amazing to yeah, me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And alas, we've already come to the end of the show. <laughs> I, I, I just want to thank you, Linda. And Jeff, it's been a great pleasure having you on the show. This is the first time all three of us have been on yeah. the show together. <laughs> Let me just remind the viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Kauai Research in Manoa. I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guests today have been Linda Martell and Jeff Taylor, who collaboratively work on planetary science research discoveries, which is just one of the websites which you can find at the University of Hawaii's website. So thank you again for joining us and come back again next week when we'll have another interesting guest to present to you. Goodbye for now.